<laughs> yeah, thank you very much for uh, yeah this great opportunity to give a talk in the Bremen Hamburg Hamburg Kiel Seminar today. Um, I will be presenting some joint work uh, I did with Patrick Tolksdorf from uh, Mainz, and you can already guess from the picture that we have here it will be uh, about fluids and their flow, but so the three whys to fix maybe the frame or the title of this of this talk are so why do airplanes fly so okay we are in the regime of fluid flow and we will be working with a uh, with a standard model to to describe phenomena uh, of nature like um, yeah flying airplanes um, so why consider the whole um, problem on Lipschitz domains. Yeah, I will also give a short answer to this. Uh, and this is, makes up for the part uh, that we consider fluid flow on rough domains here. And why work in LP spaces? Yeah, this has uh, something to do with some regularity considerations that we will uh, dive into today. And LP spaces are the playground to, to do this. So let's uh, embark a plane. and. Um, so planes fly, and if we if we look at the wing, so there is some physics happening here. So this is just a cross section of the of the wing that we have here. And if we would place sensors outside of the wing, uh, we would see that below the wing there is a higher pressure exerted from the fluid surrounding it than on the upper side. Um, at the same time, the fluid, in our case air, flows around the wing. And we will also, see, well, if we would measure the velocity of the fluid, we would see that the velocity is higher on the top of the wing and lower on the bottom. So what happens now is we have a, we have a model that, um, well, that tries to um, explain what, what we see here in, a, in terms of a, a system of partial differential equations. Namely, um, what we want to know is why, why does, a, does a flow phenomenon like this generate lift, for example. And the model that we are going to look at here are the Navier-Stokes equations, which uh, in, well, on a very high level of abstraction are just a uh, conservation law for momentum. And on the one side of this conservation law, we have the, the quantity that we are looking at, which in our case is a specific uh, momentum. Um, and on the other hand, we have um, yeah, certain external factors that contribute to changes in momentum. One of them, which is modeled by the Laplacian, so u here is, is the velocity of the surrounding of the particles, we also have the pressure, as you already saw. And we uh, furthermore have some external forces that I'll be calling F here. Furthermore, um, in regimes like this, or also if you think about liquids that flow around, um, there is uh, another condition that uh, we call uh, the incompressibility that just tells us the div this, that the divergence of our, uh, of our velocity field equals zero. Then uh, we also have some conditions on the boundary. If we consider a bounded volume where this flow occurs, um, sometimes what we do here is we just assume that the fluid sticks, for example, to a wall, which amounts to a Dirichlet condition. Let's call our domain omega. We have here a system of partial differential equations. So u is the velocity. In our case, it would be a two-dimensional vector, so the velocity in the one direction and the velocity in the other direction. We have a further quantity, the pressure here. And well, this is how the system looks like. Um, we have a change in time, so we also assume an initial, um, uh, an initial condition. U at point zero equals zero in our domain. So this this system has been fairly used for a long time, also numerical simulation. So in, in certain types of problems, we can work with it, and it 
works very well. For example, it also serves uh, in order to explain why fluid flows the way it does and how it generates it. So why is it natural to consider fluid flow in rougher domains? That's a very good question. So because if a gas is at rest like air here, it's clearly compressible. Yeah, so you could, for example, if you would uh, put it inside the cylinder and then push down one side of the cylinder, you would be able to compress it. But at, um, at higher numbers of fluid flow, this is, this is a, an assumption that uh, one can use uh, in this case. So um, of course, you would, not, you would not be able to use um, this assumption for air if the air is standing or moving at lower uh, Mach numbers, but at, but at high Mach numbers, this is a, is a, the incompressibility assumption is, is used a lot also in numerics. And um, yeah, so I agree with you that there is a certain limitation to whether this physical model can be applied to, but um, yeah. But this is a this is also a dynamical pressure. So this this pressure comes from from the from the speed yes, that uh, that the velocity has. Yeah, it's not the pressure that that we are currently experiencing here, or the pressure that gets lower when we when you, for example, climb on Mount Everest. So okay. this is the hydrostatic pressure. The hydrostatic pressure normally is to be found in this in this additional force term here. It's also a good question. So, um, if, yeah, if, if we would look at it at this, it would be like an external domain. So we just have an internal boundary and the rest is um, yeah, well, so unbounded. So uh, yes, yeah, so we could, we could do that, but um, I'm going to talk on, about bounded domains here. So it's better to assume yeah, that uh, we, have a, we have a large container, so to say, and then uh, in this container. Yeah. It could also be something, yeah, or they just maybe also just having something that looks like this, yeah. So uh, part of the ring. Um, of a of a particle. So uh, we have a we have a field of physical quantities here, and if I take out one point, let's say here, this point has a coordinate x in R two, then I can assign to this point via this uh, velocity field. A velocity u1 of x and the velocity u2 of x. And the pressure, this is a scalar quantity. Yes, yes. So um, yeah, we are we are moving with the um, with the wing and we are experiencing yeah. the fluid flow. Yeah, thank you very much. Further questions on the physics? Because uh, this won't be a physics lesson. <laughs> uh, it's just a little bit of motivation of why, why we are considering this problem here. Um, so we already talked about our frame and also about uh, the boundary that we have here. And also, if you look outside the window, for example, you see this garage here. There are a lot of edges um, that, well, if air is moving through it or around it, will yeah, will also experience these edges. So therefore, um, so we could say that real applications, or real world applications have edges, they have corners. And um, so what we are going to do in this talk is therefore also assume that our uh, system of partial differential equation lives on a bounded uh, Lipschitz domain, meaning that the boundary is given locally as a graph of a Lipschitz continuous function. And Lipschitz domains are challenging for at least three reasons here. Namely that a lot of classical results that we know for Navier-Stokes and also other um, uh, problems with partial differential equation, they usually assume more smoothness on the boundary. And if one um, well, forgets about the smoothness and reduces it to the case of a rough domain like the Lipschitz domain, these results cease to exist. For example, existence of solution, regularity, 
of the solution. And um, therefore, there is not, yeah, there's, this is still an open field of research, at least to uh, try to mimic uh, some of the results that there are for smooth, dom smooth domains. Um, yeah, one of, the, one of the reasons that one can uh, think about this is that localization techniques uh, fail. Because if you tr try to localize at one point, then um, yeah, the, the maps that, that you use to localize, they are not smooth enough to, in some sense, differentiate uh, through, this, um, through this map. And um, yeah, this is one of the reasons that uh, yeah, one needs to think about other tools that come into play here. And um, some of them I will also show you. Some other results use them implicitly. A lot of them come from um, harmonic analysis. And I think one, one prominent example here is also the method of boundary layer potentials that is used here in order to, yeah, um, to work with this kind of rough boundary. So let's come to the last why. So um, about the regularity, because of course, we have a differential equation. We are looking for a, for a way to solve it. And it may not be possible to find, at, well, at first try, a solution in terms of classical spaces here. Therefore, it's natural to weaken the, the space or the assumptions on what a solution is, where the solution lives. And um, yeah, therefore, Lebesgue spaces come into play. And this has been done, well, some time ago by Leray and Hopf. They found via Galerkin approximation, which is a Hilbert space technique, so we are in the L2 setting here, um, a solution to the system of equations um, by, yeah, by first defining a suitable notion of solution, which I briefly uh, stated here, but um, we won't get too much into detail. So basically, we are testing this equation with, um, yeah, with a special class of test functions that well, allows us to ignore the pressure because um, our, our vector fields here also are divergence free. And we get at least some sort of, of solution that can also be made sense of in some uh, other physical terms. But um, yeah, it's only a weak solution. And first of all, there is only existence of a solution. The second question would be, is the solution unique? And this is another play uh, or another, another situation where it's good that we are in the LP space setting because in the L2 setting, um, what could be done was to prove uniqueness um, in the two-dimensional sense. In the three-dimensional um, problem, so think about now the whole wing, not only one intersection, it could be shown that solutions of this type created uh, via the method of Leray and Hopf, they are not unique. There are some um, ideas that guarantee uniqueness, but they leave now the L2 setting by formulating a condition that basically tells us, okay, we also want our solution to adhere to a so-called Serin condition. And this Serin condition contains, well, other LP spaces with P different than two. So this is another um, motivation of why we work in LP spaces, because at least in the three-dimensional setting, these spaces come into play for um, uniqueness reasons here. All right. So what, what we want to do here today is we stick to the two-dimensional case. So we have existence of a, a weak solution and also um, we have uniqueness. We want to show that these solutions are more regular than one would get from just the Leray Hopf approach here. And how we are going to do this is by um, linearizing our problem and looking, so, so to say, at the linear part of Navier Stokes and then um, using maximal regularity of the linear part to tell us something about the solution we had before but telling us that the regularity is even better than we assume. To this, so let me introduce some, some of the spaces that we will be working with. All uh, of them are motivated by this uh, incompressibility condition, namely that the divergence is zero here. So we have a space of, of test functions here that we close with respect to the usual Lebesgue norm and also uh, with respect to the Sobolev norms that give us these spaces LP sigma and um, W, KP, zero sigma, 
So also incorporating this, um, this boundary condition here that we have. So these spaces are the ones we work in. This are also the spaces where we look for solutions. Um, they ha have another nice property because you see we have also this pressure here. And as it turns out, um, in certain, for certain values of P, these, spa these space LP sigma are actually uh, complemented in the Banach space by a space, well, I did not give a name here, but you see it is made up of um, vector fields that stem from, um, well, from an LP function. And this, is, this is precisely where the pressure also will come from. So what this allows us now is to project also, let's, let's do it formally at this point, to apply this projection to this um, the system of equations that we have here. So it's not the Navier-Stokes, but the projected Navier-Stokes equation. And what, we'll, what we will turn out to have here, and I will also reorder some terms. Um, so we will have the projection applied to the negative Laplacian of U, the projection applied to the, to the pressure will vanish because the pressure stems precisely from the, from the so-called topological complement here. And um, well, then we will also apply our uh, projection to the right-hand side, which consists of F and also this convective nonlinear term. And so assuming that, that this all makes sense, then we have here a nice linear operator. Can read this one and use another color that we will just call AP. So the Stokes, this will be on a well on a on a space where we can, where we can make sense, for example, of the Laplacian. One question. Yes. Uh, first, we assume now that U is also an F. Yes. So this is what we that this is also what we assume for a solution. And then yeah. the question you mentioned that this holds for some p. So I know for p, let's see which p. We will get uh, into oh. detail uh, later, but um, I can give you the range of p. So it goes at least from four over three to four. So this is an interval around two where this where this will be possible. Um, yeah, so it's not as easy as in the in the smooth domain. So we have some limitations here, but um, yeah, it's a fair question. So I just assumed that I have a projection. Then I can do a formal calculation like this. It gives me a, some sort of linear operator. And now the idea will be um, to use or to show that this operator has maximal LS regularity for also some S that still has to be specified. So um, why would this be interesting? Um, think. Um, so let's do it here on this part. Hope you can still see it if I write there. So what, what, what would we do if we had an equation like this? So we would write u as a mild solution to this, uh, to this problem, assuming that this, that this operator is nice enough. So we would write u of t as e to the minus T A P times U zero. So this would be a semi-group. So this would be nice if this operator also generates a semi-group. And then just use the variation of constants formula on the right hand side. So let's just call this right hand side F tilde. And then use maximal regularity to conclude that, um, well, for example, if, it's, if, if we could, if we would know that our um, right hand side comes from a space LS, which with values in, I think, LP sigma is what I wrote here. And if we also have an initial value, u0, that also comes from a space LP sigma with values in the domain. Of AP. So this is just an in the interpolation space that I wrote here. That then also our solution uh, will have 
the regularity of the well, of the input parts here. So namely, then maximal regularity would tell us um, that our solution u is an element of omega one s uh, with values at l p sigma intersected with um, l s values in the domain of a p with an s that still needs to be fixed, but um, yeah, we will get to this in a minute. So maybe let's also um, fix here on the board uh, what the current setting of regularity is that we part from, namely the leray hopf solutions that I gave to you in the beginning. So um, we have this class LH infinity, the leray hopf solutions, and in there we are just uh, L0 uh, infinity, uh, sorry, L infinity is a bounded um, with values in um, W1, uh, 2, intersected with um, L2, so I hope I'm doing this the right way. Um, L2 sigma. No, it's the other way around. Yeah, so we will we will increase this weak notion of solution to one where we can really talk about also what it means to uh, differentiate here in with respect to time. So we will have increased time regularity, and we will also have an increased uh, space regularity here, so that it really makes sense to uh, plug in something here in the operator and not just have uh, something. This is basically the domain of the form that underlies the, the operator in the Hilbert space. So. Our maximal regularity argument builds on three ingredients. So this was just a formal calculation here that I carried out. But what we need, of course, is, as you pointed out, we need to know that there is a Helmholtz projection, that there are really, well, this is just a formal calculation, but how can I get the pressure back once I have done this? Yeah, I'm working with an equation that has no pressure. How can I reconstruct the pressure I need? One way to do it is via the Helmholtz projection. The next thing I need to uh, next thing I need to fix or well, to prove is that there is a Stokes semigroup that is um, well at least um, in a way that I can write uh, my solution here. So it could should be an analytic semigroup, for example. And on top, I also need to show that this operator has the property of maximal regularity. So this whole argument carries through. So. The Helmholtz projection, and there you see how much time went after the discovery or the proof for leray hopf solutions until one had at least um, a Helmholtz projection on bounded Lipschitz domain. So it was in 1998, there was a proof for domains with dimension greater or equal than three. And then um, also, this is the range that I put here on the board by Dorina Magnitrea in 2002. There was existence for all Lipschitz bounded Lipschitz domains um, with uh, yeah, this, this interval here. And of course, if p equals 2, there is no problem at all. So the, um, so the advancement of the theory was by extending the validity outside of 2. Because uh, if p equals 2, then this is just a Hilbert, Hilbert space method. The regularity does not matter at all. We have a Helmholtz projection for bounded domains. Yeah, regularity does not doesn't play a role here. And so the question was raised, is the, uh, well, the analyticity or the sectoriality of this operator maybe related to the Helmholtz projection? And does it occur on the same um, range? This was conjectured, uh, conjectured by Taylor for um, yeah, well, the case of dimensions three and larger, and by Dorina Nitrea in the same paper where she broke this up. She would, uh, would say, well, I assume that this could also hold uh, in the two-dimensional setting. And so from 2000 to 2012, so another 12 years later, uh, wrote a, a, a seminal paper. So a lot of theory had to be developed to, to really prove that the Stokes operator, so this linear part here, is in fact the sectorial operator on the same range of piece. And um, so 
using this proof and the ideas here, um, together with Patrick Tolksdorf, we extended the result also to the two-dimensional setting. So um, with the techniques that uh, I hopefully have also some time to show in the course of this um, talk, we even showed that the Stokes operators are sectorial. And coming back to maximal regularity, there's a, a, a result by Lutz Weiss that relates R sectoriality to maximal LS regularity, which is where we want to land in order to carry out this argument. So how do we prove um, the R sectoriality here? Um, so we already have the result in the two-dimensional setting, so we need to find a technique or the goal is to yeah, somehow push the sectoriality or extrapolate it to other values of P. So we aim for values that are greater than two and then do a duality argument for the values uh, less than two. You can also uh, guess this already from the, from the boundaries that we have here because they are Hilda conjugated to each other. And so um, the overall strategy that was also used by Kunstmann and Weiss in one of their papers on the Stokes operator and uh, with some uh, ideas also that Tolstoy had, we reformulate the R sectoriality in terms of vector valued families. I will go into detail what this means and then use an, the, a, a specific result for the extrapolation of operators that are bounded on L2 spaces in order to um, yeah, extend them to LP spaces. And the main ingredient here will be to prove the weak reverse Hilda estimate. We will also see what this is all about. So um, reformulating the strategy uh, or reformulating R sectoriality means um, we, we need to look at R boundedness here. So think about sectoriality condition. This talks about the family of operators, namely the resolvent times the resolvent parameter. We have a family of bounded operators and we want this family to be uniformly bounded in some sense. For our bounded families, this is a little bit more involved. Here, we do not consider only one operator, but finite sums of these operators. And um, in the way that we are going to use it, we will talk about uh, establishing a square function estimate in order to prove um, our boundedness. So we want to reformulate this in a vector-valued way. And one way to do it is well, to look closely at what is happening here. So basically, this is just an, uh, a, a vector norm in L2. So we can just say, OK, I have a sequence TK, FK in an uh, L2 space that is uh, C2 valued. I can just write this as a, well, as a mixed space here and then say, well, I have the LP norm of one of these vectors, and I want to estimate it against another. What is the, um, the goal or the idea behind that? I want to reduce the problem again to have a, having a single operator that I work with and not, um, well, not a family or a sum of families here. Um, so what, what does this mean in our case of the Stokes operator? So we have um, R boundedness for where well, we want to look at this family here. And so the family that we will be working on in detail. So if you look at the construction, we always need like a finite subfamily. And in this case, um, well, this corresponds to uh, taking value uh, to um, using a, uh, uh, this, taking a k zero out of n, taking a finite amount of um, resolvent parameters lambda one to lambda k zero that all come from a vector or to fix the angle of the vector here. And we take then, of course, FKs coming from LP sigma spaces. And the operators, of course, that we are going to look at are, well, then formed out of the operators that we have in the standard here. So um, considering 1 plus lambda k times um, well, resolvent. And okay, so I talked about um, extrapolating a single operator. How will the single operator look like? 
I call this operator capital T. Capital T will be a vector valued concatenation of these TKs here. So I will also name them T lambda K, K going from 1 to, um, to K0. And this one will map a sequence of FKs, where K is an element of the natural number. So if I, if I take a K0, I just extended this vector by 0 and mapping this one to a vector like this um, 1 plus lambda 1 lambda 1 is a2 2 to the minus 1 p f1 and so on until I hit uh, line k and then zero. I also want the, uh, the zero to be included in the resolvent set. Um, therefore, yeah, therefore yeah, I, yeah, um, yeah. I do this because I know it works. If I just wanted to have sectoriality, you are completely right. I could just yeah, omit. So this is, um, well, two for one, yeah. just because the proof carries through. All right. So this is the operator that we will be looking at. And so we want to show, once again, this family is R bounded. And in the case of this vector valued um, well, uh, approach, this amounts to saying that TF in uh, a P norm with sequence valued in L2 is smaller or equal than the constant that, of course, cannot depend um, on. Uh, well, let's maybe make it more clear. That, that, uh, it's not allowed to depend on the resolvent parameters that I choose. So, how does the extrapolation work like? And this is a very nice result from, um, yeah, from harmonic analysis that was also proven by Shen, so seven years before he actually proved the sectoriality for the, the Stokes operator. And then also extended by Tolksdorf to a, um, to a well, vector valued case. This is why you have here a very general setting. So X will be a Banach space, Y will be just a bounded domain that is open. And um, yeah, assuming that our operator T that we have here fulfills a weak reverse Helder estimate. What is a weak um, reverse Helder estimate? It's a reverse Helder estimate, meaning that the P that we have here on the left-hand side is actually bigger than the one that we have on the right-hand side. Usually in Helder estimates, it's the other way around. Weak, it is because I'm integrating here over a smaller ball with radius R, and on the right-hand side, there's a larger ball. This is why, why we call it a weak um, Helder estimate. And well, I cannot do this. Um, so I need to specify the x zeros and the radii for which I do this. And I will need to consider points that are situated either on the boundary of epsilon or um, completely contained here. So I have two classes of points for which I need to prove this estimate here. And this estimate also serves as some kind of um, quantified p-sensitive way to, to talk about the non-locality of an operator because I'm considering or I'm plugging in functions f that have a support outside of the domains of integration that I'm considering here. So a local operator would just not see anything, but well, the operator that we will be working on is a non-local one. So he will experience um, uh, well f here, even though we uh, well, are not integrating about the support. And the main message of the theorem is, well, it works our case. Um, because if we have an estimate like this, so we call the estimate for some p, then um, I, can I can extend the family that also already is bounded on L2 to another LP space, namely all LP spaces that lay between Q and P. Here's also a sketch of one of the situations that we are considering here. So this is the support, and then we have the three uh, balls that we, are, uh, that we are working with. Um, so see if the time still allows. So 
how do we now work with the theorem when we want to apply uh, it to our situation? So what we're going to fix first is, um, so of course, we need to we need to prove our uh, weak reverse elastic. And in our situation, the space epsilon will be, oh, this will just our bound Lipschitz domain, Banner space x will be little l2 with values in c2, and p is something that I leave as a blank here because it will become clearer in the proof later what we need to put in here. Then um, I also need to fix a value of r0, so these balls that I consider are not for a sixth radius, but I need to also consider range here. I will not go into the detail here, but r0 comes from uh, the Lipschitz geometry of, this, uh, of our Lipschitz domain here. And then um, I'm also not, not going to do full proof here. It's this, the simplest part of this proof is considering uh, the point x0 that comes from our domain such that um, the 3r ball around x0 is completely contained in, in omega here. Yeah? So for all r in this range. And just to write it down, f will be an L affinity function that has values in L2. With the support of f, that is disjoint from 3r ball with center x. Okay. The operators that we are looking at, maybe to refresh it briefly, are made up of uh, in component wise of the resolvent of the Stokes operator. And this is also something that we will work on here. So we are defining UK as well one part that we also find in TK. So and we do this for all K between one and K zero. And of course, UK solves the Stokes resultant problem on a um, well, on a bounded Lipschitz domain in the L2 case. It's constructed like this. It's the resultant of it. But it does not only this. It also solves uh, a Dirichlet problem on all of these smaller circles. So let me also write down the. This, I think, is the real one. So the Dirichlet problem that is also solved here. Namely, UK solves a problem where there's also an associated pressure, phi k, with right hand side fk on a ball ds of x, uh, with center x, x0, where s also comes from, a, well, it goes from 2r, uh, from r. It corresponds to the values of R here. Um, then, as it, of course, is also incompressible. And there is one additional fact: if we have a solution on um, when, on a Lipschitz domain in L two, we have actually an inner regularity result that tells us that the solution inside of this domain of the Stokes resolvent problem is actually. Uh, at least Hölder continues, so we can also talk about traces of the solution here. And I will just call it here, so the notation makes sense. It will, I will call it G on DBS of x0. But G is nothing else than UK evaluated at um, well, the boundary of DS. So we are two. We are two times. Two, 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 we are twice uh, talking about solutions here, um, but I want to reformulate a, a new problem that is solved by the solution that I already have on the on the greater domain. Yeah, of course. If I 
maybe it's it's easier to look at this problem. If I, have, if I have a solution on all of omega, then I should also have a solution to a Dirichlet problem that is located inside of omega. And if this problem is unique, this may give me additional insight on what the solution on the whole of omega is actually capable of doing. And so this is all I, I wanted to do here. So I'm, I'm taking the trace of the whole function to just say, okay, if I restrict my function to, to one of these balls, it solves a Dirichlet problem with a non-zero Dirichlet value that is precisely given by the trace here. And this problem has um, a further uh, component. So this Dirichlet problem is namely that non-tangential maximal function, which is also a term for Lipschitz domains that in some sense um, helps us to talk about boundary values, is uh, in L2 of the boundary of S. And what I can now do is, um, well, or what, what we needed to do was, well, to establish not only solvability of this problem, but also continuous dependence on the data. Which is why we proved, uh, well, just like Shen did in his three-dimensional paper, we needed to prove the theorem of precisely this L2 Dirichlet problem that allows us to estimate the non-tangential maximal function against the data I plug in, against the Dirichlet value. And this Dirichlet value, well, is, um, well, in our case, a little bit easier. Uh, it's, just, um, well, it's just a function itself, which allows us to concatenate these proofs later on. Um, and we have another lemma that we needed to use here that uh, helps us to also estimate to the other side the uh, non-tangential maximal function against um, well, itself. But now we are comparing a boundary integral versus an integral on the whole space. And here you see, in the two-dimensional case, this result works for a specific value of p. And this is well, um, what also dictates later on the value that, uh, that we have in our results. So, um, exactly. So if we, if we would have here different p, so for example, if we would have p equals to 5, then this would carry out through the whole proof. So because the, um, the result that we have here also only talks about the weak reverse Hölder estimate p versus 2. And the larger the p is, the, uh, the better the extent of this formula is because I get continuity on the whole range. Uh, but this is, this is just the result that we got. And I think um, as time is almost up, I will spare you the details of um, concatenating these estimates. But hopefully you see that they, they fit nicely together. If I use uk here, I can estimate uk versus uh, the non-tangential maximal function. And then as UK also solves the Dirichlet problem, I can estimate the, um, the non-tangential maximal function against the trace of U itself. And if you read the right-hand side here, I have an L2 estimate. And on the left-hand side here, I have an L4 estimate. Of course, this is not the rigorous proof, but uh, time does not allow, um, sadly. But this is precisely the way that, that we want our estimate to look. Yeah, so we have an estimate on the resolvent. Yeah, U will be a resolvent. We can also see that this estimate carries through if we have a prefactor here. And this will give us the weak reverse Helder estimate. And if we trace back our journey up to now, we have a weak Helder estimate. That means our operator T Our operator T extrapolates to a family on LP. If this is a family on LP, this family is R-bounded. R-boundedness of this family means that, due to the result of not twice, that, this, that the operator here, uh, uh, the Stokes operator, is R-sectorial. And um, so, no. R-boundedness of this family means R-sectoriality of the operator, and R-sectoriality of the operator means Ls maximal regularity, which brings us back to the result that we had here. And this is exactly what we 
are able to prove. So um, well, this value of s will also be dictated by the fact that the right-hand side here also contains u. Um, Lerey-Hopf solutions need also to fulfill a certain regularity condition on this convective term. So the right-hand side matches the regularity of, um, well, of the f that I plug in here. And well, that is the result. And we can uh, basically just carry out the proof as we did it here, and we get the higher regularity result for uh, weak Lerey-Hopf solutions. What can you take home from this talk? So our operators are sectorial and has therefore also LS uh, maximum regularity. The P range for the R sectoriality of the Stokes operator is exactly the one that we have for the Helmholtz projection. And well, compared to the three-dimensional case on Lipschitz domains that are planar, we have higher regularity. Further things that we also could not consider today is that the Stokes operator also has a maximal, um, has a bounded H infinity calculus. We can also characterize some of the domains of the Stokes operator. And uh, a similar result as the one before also holds if we have right hand sides coming from spaces of distributions. So thanks again for having me here. And yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions.